Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society, you are all very welcome to this afternoon's event. Um, so far this week in, in the HIST 250 celebrations, we have looked at local issues such as what happens in our universities, moved through a broader context of how do we deal with like, the common law post-Brexit, then through into even bigger European challenges such as solidarity and cohesion. Today's focus, um, both in this panel discussion and the discussions later today, which will be held in the GMB, is on m even broader issues. So the global challenge of the climate crisis um, and how do we both mitigate these issues um, with existing technologies. So it is, it, actually, as a scientist as well, it gives me great pleasure to have such, a, such an event. Um, so often in these kind of societies which are based around discourse and discussion, there is often an underrepresentation of people who study STEM subjects um, or have a more technical background. So having an event like this is extremely important. And if any of you are scientists, you are more than welcome today as well. Um, so I would like to introduce our MC for this afternoon's event, which is Professor David McConnell, and he is also president of the College Historical Society. For most of you, he needs no introduction, but he is a very celebrated geneticist um, and a pioneer in science communication in Ireland. So I would ask you to join me in welcoming Professor David McConnell. Mr. Auditor, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society, and ladies and gentlemen, that's our formal way of saying things in the HIST. So it's wonderful to see you all here today, midday on a lovely day. And as uh, uh, the auditor said, uh, I have been a scientist. And I feel, as I think many of you, because you're here today, and many of you feel that science has an extraordinary important role. And engineering, let's be clear, we're talking about science, technology, engineering. And indeed, when I gave my inaugural address in 1964, I wanted to uh, make sure that science and technology was there, and I invited a wonderful man called Lieutenant General Michael Joseph Costello, who was the man who was sort of actually the manager of the Irish Sugar Company. And what was he doing? He was masterminding the introduction of a new industry to Ireland, making certain that we would become independent in the supply of sugar. We'd been through the Second World War. We knew what the problem was. And of course, he was a, an innovator. Amongst other things, the Irish Sugar Company installed, I'm told, one of the first commercial uh, computers in the country. So others can confirm that or not. So there are people here who know a bit more about it than I do. In any case, today we are faced with even greater challenges. The theme of this week, the underlying theme, has been challenges to democracy, challenges to our civilization. And to my mind, there is nothing that is posing a greater challenge to us than our environment and, of course, the role of energy in determining the way the environment changes. And uh, I was uh, in California at the time that uh, Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson, showing us that we were producing ghastly waste, which was destroying all you know, huge swathes of industrial areas in, in the world, and indeed through DDT, threatening all birds of prey. I remember the Club of Rome being established. I remember the limits to growth. And we're talking about 50 to 60 years ago when we knew that we were damaging our environment in a very serious way. And of course, the Club of Rome drew attention to the energy problem, and the oil crisis took place in 1973. The simple fact of the matter, I think, is that as societies, I don't mean as individuals, we still don't understand what's going on. We're not aware. We are not aware of the threats to our society, the threats to our globe posed by uh, our abuse of the environment, and in particular, our failure to deal with the question of energy. So it's an enormous pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Eddie O'Connor to you. I have heard him speak once before. I have read about him, of course. And I see him as a pioneer. And indeed, he is known worldwide as a pioneer in the idea that we can decarbonize. We can stop using oil and gas. We don't have to use them anymore. We don't need coal. We don't need peat. And by the way, he was formerly the head of Board Namona. And he was uh, responsible for beginning the move within Bordnemona to wind energy in Ireland, establishing, if I'm right, Eddie, the first wind farm in North Mayo. And then he moved out of Bordnemona and has now moved to become a global leader. 
Uh, he's described in Scientific American as a world energy policy leader. His companies, in particular mainstream, uh, these are pioneering new technologies which will take us away uh, from carbon. And we need to know about them, and we need to understand that the technologies already exist, most of them, lots of progress still to be made. But I would like us to know more about, to feel that the technologies are there, and to feel that the challenges are not so much in the technologies as they are social and political and economic. Tonight, we will hear Sir Paul Collier talk about the challenges to capitalism. It's very simple. Capitalism is based on the idea of growth. We live on a finite planet. Those two things cannot be brought together. They are paradoxical. They cannot, you cannot have societies based on an economy based on growth, 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 when things are limited. It doesn't mean we can't do better. There's a word called efficiency. We can get the same but much, 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 much more cleverly. In any case, I'm not going to go on any longer. You are not here to hear me. You're here to hear Eddie O'Connor show how we can, in fact, decarbonize our planet. Eddie, it's a great pleasure to invite you to sit. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, Mr. Provost, uh, uh, Professor Davis, uh, Mr. Auditor, um, and I'm here to talk about a revolution in energy supply. And I'm talking about the complete movement uh, to renewable energy and the non use of fossil fuels for energy purposes. The principal technology in a non fossil fired world is electricity. By the way, technology is never value free, it exists because somebody puts a value on developing it. With me, it's all about doing away with the production of CO2 for energy purposes. I discovered in 1989 uh, from a board member who worked here in Trinity College, uh, Dr. Owen O'Neill, uh, that CO2 was one of these greenhouse gases uh, and that CO2 trapped energy in the Earth's atmosphere and that we were adding to this every year uh, with further increase in CO2. Uh, I was a, a great sinner when I discovered that. I was in charge of board pneumonia, as David has said, and I uh, was releasing, responsible for releasing 10 million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. Now, the concentration of CO2 at the moment is, as you are all aware, is about 410 parts per million by volume. And in pre-industrial times, that was about 270 parts per million. The atmosphere is capturing energy at a rate equivalent to four Hiroshima atomic bombs every second. Um, the, and, and in a report published last week uh, by Greenpeace uh, for the Centre for Research uh, on Energy and Clean Air, it was estimated that the current cost to the peoples of the world uh, of, of this excessive CO2 uh, is 2.9 trillion. Thanks very much. <laughs> 2.9 trillion. By the way, that's 3% of the world's GDP. Um, and if you were to estimate for every ton. Of, of CO2 release because there was 36.8 billion tonnes additional CO2 released last year. Uh, that works out to $79 uh, for every tonne. Now, my old friend Alan Matthews is here to discuss these issues with me at the end. Um, as an economist, Alan, you are proxy for all economists in the world, unfortunately. Uh, the profession's inability to put pollution uh, at the centre of political, economic uh, debate and budget action is one of the scandals of this era. Um, and I look forward to debating that with you. Um, uh, Alan is an old friend of mine. He was president of the Students' Council in Trinity, uh, or the Union, when I was president in UCD uh, back in 68. So as I said, once I found out that CO2 uh, was doing this to the planet, I dedicated my life to removing this scourge uh, from the human firmament. In a world that is increasingly technological, and sometimes obscurely so, it's refreshing to realise that decarbonisation relies on two apparently simple uh, generation uh, technologies. We have wind and we have solar, mainly uh, photovoltaic. Put simply, use electricity for everything and make all electricity from wind and solar. Modern wind generation began... Let me see, can I get this now? Yes. Modern wind generation began with the Gedser machine uh, which is up there in, in Denmark. It was built in 1955, 
Uh, it made 200 kilowatts, and it was three-bladed. All modern wind turbines actually follow that model. Um, it's, it, uh, the upwind means it's facing into the wind, it's not behind the, the nacelle, which is the, the big lump of stat stationary stuff up there. Um, it, it went 12 years uh, without, without fundamental maintenance. The blades are fixed in position, uh, and uh, when the wind blows at a strong speed, the back pressure on the blade equals the pressure coming from the front, so the blade stops automatically. So they're what's called stall-regulated machines. Now, they're a precursor of what, of what every machine is today, which is um, regulated by the, by the blade turning, um, and uh, pitch-regulated is what we call that. Now, when we built Ireland's first wind farm in 1992, the size of the turbines were 250 kilowatts, uh, with an experimental 400 kilowatt machine uh, installed. Now the size of on-land wind turbines is 5 megawatts, uh, a factor of 20 times larger. Offshore, the standard size is 12 megawatts. You have no limit offshore to the size you can build a wind turbine. As turbines grow bigger, uh, they get more cost effective. And the reason for this is twofold. First of all, they're much taller. The machines in Bella Corrig were built about 40 metres. The ones we're building in Chile right now are about 130 metres. So as you get higher above the earth, uh, the wind speed goes up, so you get more energy out of the available air. And the second reason is the cost of wind turbines is proportional to the length of the blade, proportional to the amount of material that's used in the turbine. But the actual energy capture and the profit and the price of electricity you can deliver is proportional to the, to the length squared. So it's pi r squared. And so, so you, know, you will see turbines getting bigger and bigger and bigger until we reach the limit of material science. At this time, Mainstream is building 1,500 megawatts of wind energy installations in Senegal, in Egypt, and in Chile. The cost in Egypt and Chile is 4.1 dollar cents per unit of electricity. But the wind turbines are not just making cheaper electricity, they're making more grid-friendly electricity. Older turbines were connected to the, the ones in Bellacorg were connected to the distribution system, and they were looked upon by the dispatchers of load uh, as, as negative load. The, the modern turbines have changed completely in design, and they're regarded now as full throttle um, power stations, uh, with all the attributes that, that power stations have. Now, the capacity factor of wind turbines, largely on account of the move offshore, is now in the order of 50%, um, with wind speeds of about 9 metres per second. With floating technology coming on at quite a pace, soon wind speeds will be 11 metres per second. And what we're showing here in this slide is a picture of the wind speeds around Europe. And you can take it that the darker areas have very low wind speeds, and the kind of bright green verging on yellow, they're the very high wind speeds, and you can see that off the coast of Ireland and Scotland, you've probably got 11 metres per second, and they'll give a capacity factor of about 65%. And so as an example of technology evolution, it was noted that there are 30, 30 different designs for floating offshore technology now. Um, in, in 2017, uh -huh. yes, great. Uh, in 2017, Equinor, the... Uh, the former uh, you know, oil and gas company uh, from uh, Norway uh, built five, uh, five megawatt machines uh, in 95 to 120 metres of water in the Buchan Deep off the coast of Scotland. And they've worked brilliantly, uh, surviving eight metre waves uh, and, and winter storms. Now, but this, is a, this is an actual... I don't know whether it's a picture or a depiction of, 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 of that uh, five uh, turbines offshore, but they are floating. And despite all the, uh, the, all the energy, uh, the world of energy could throw at them, uh, the, the deflection of the nacelle, which is the, the part, you know, about 95 metres up, that only deflected by three degrees, which is amazing when you think of it. So it, it, it looks out into the wind coming at it. Uh, the lasers detect the speed of the wind coming and adjust the pitch of the blade so that it reduces this, that force that's going to cause the turbine to, you know, to, to go in that, uh, in, in a, you know, backwards when, when a strong uh, gust hits it. Now, there are other designs, um, and I will show you 
just that. This is the uh, design from Principal Power. It's been installed in the recent past off the coast of Portugal. Um, and this is another possibly more realistic view of it with some waves, um, which you, you can see that it's, it's got three flotation devices there. And just to complete the picture, here's the kind of evolution that we've gone through. Uh, we did, um, I should say, install the first uh, offshore wind farm uh, in Ireland, which is in the Arco Banks, as, as many of you will know. Um, and that's going steadily. We built that in 2003. I have to say, without the slightest help from the government, uh, not a grant in sight, um, uh, ourselves and GE decided we were, this was worth doing, and so we did it, and it's still going strong. And it doesn't interfere with anybody's golf when they play at the European club. Now, the story of, of photovoltaics uh, is equally dramatic. The photovoltaics was very expensive up to 2009, until the Chinese began the mass production uh, of units based on silicon, uh, and, and, and they, they start to flood the world with that. Another factor in the rapid deployment and the, and the cost digression of PV was that Germany introduced a, a support scheme. So PV uh, used to be flat fixed surfaces that faced roughly in the direction of the sun, uh, but now they're, they're, they're tracking the sun from sunrise to sunset. There's what we call single axis tracking. So they, they face the sun when it's low in the sky, and then as the sun rises, they go like that. And, and we are looking at capacity factors uh, of 30% of now in really sunny areas, such as uh, in Spain or Morocco, or, or actually largely around the Mediterranean basin. In an unexpected development, as far as I was concerned, we're beginning to see floating PV uh, on lakes, reservoirs, and tailing ponds from mines. This is uh, one such uh, picture here of uh, you know, I thought this was impossible because electricity and water don't like one another. Uh, but nevertheless, when you're, when you're short of space and you have a nice flat area, they've, they've now actually mastered the technology of, of uh, putting... Uh, <laughs> that no, no, not the Shetlands. That's probably Thailand. I, 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 suspect, I suspect they're both from Thailand, which is where uh, a lot of this stuff's been done. Um, anyway, we're, we're now using, um, to increase the capacity factor of, of uh, so solar photovoltaics, they've been built on, on white areas, or they're putting in white gravel on the ground, because they, the sun gets reflected back up from the gravel, and, and so they have what we call bifacial modules now, so that they, they capture some more energy uh, on the, from the radiation on its way out. The net result of all this innovation, uh, which is of great interest to every customer, is that solar PV is now producing electricity at incredibly low prices. In desert, desert areas, such as, for instance, in Abu Dhabi and in Saudi Arabia, we're looking at prices as low as 1.5 cents. In Chile in 2016, uh, my company, Mainstream, bid 2.96 cents per unit of electricity, and we didn't win a contract. Somebody bid 2.91. Now, you know, you know what you're paying for electricity here. I suspect, like me, you're paying 17 cents. So, you know, they've, they've actually cracked uh, the, the cost uh, thing with, with PV and also with wind. Now, there are two revolutionary aspects associated with all these developments. And, and this sounds trivial to say, and I got uh, taken up on it at one stage. The fuel is free. Capital costs are higher, particularly in the case of wind. Uh, and, but once built, the fuel comes for free. And thus we have Bellacoric, which was built in 1992, still bashing out the megawatts. I think I hit that one now, do I? Oh, no, the other one. All right. <laughs> yeah, we're nearly getting there. Um, you know, it's still running, and I believe when my grandchildren have grandchildren, it could still be running. It probably won't, but, uh, and, and all that fuel is free, and we don't have to pay for it. Um, now, the second point uh, that is revolutionary is the CIA have published their estimates of the LCOE, that's the levelised cost of energy uh, from coal-fired plant being built today. And the LCOE of, of, of coal today, is, according to the CIA, is $9.2 uh, dollar cents per unit. And remember I said we, we're building in Chile now from wind at 4.1, and 
you know, solar is even cheaper again than that. But that 9.2 cents contains no figure for pollution. So you're not comparing like with like. When you say wind costs 4.1 and coal costs 9.2, that's an unfair and ridiculous comparison because there's a real cost associated with this stuff going up in the atmosphere. Um, and when you, when you work it out, do a little bit of maths, you find out that that cost is actually 8.17 cents for every unit of electricity. So the real cost coming from a 9.2 nominal cost coal-fired uh, coal power station is 17.37 cents against, as I say, our price for wind and solar. Now, why economists don't point out these facts to decision makers need some analysis? Uh, they're all captured. Are they all captured by the oil industry? Now, I can't believe that Alan Matthews or, or most economists that, that I would come across are captured by the oil industry, but I know for a fact that in the UN and the United Nations uh, and, and the World Bank and even Bloomberg, who's nominally on our side, that they don't actually take, they don't publicize and take this into account in decision making. Um, Chevron and Exxon have spent 3.4 billion uh, on convincing the world that global warming uh, doesn't exist. Or even if it does exist, well, but you need us anyway. And who would pay attention to all these uh, alarmists, these, uh, uh, these global, uh, you know, uh, I think that was the, the, the word that Trump used when he was in Davos recently, you know, climate alarmists. Mm. Now, before to going on to describe the other technologies for the decarbonisation, it's helpful to describe what demand will look like in Europe when no more fossil fuels are used for energy purposes. And I think this is an important thing to say. We're not just going to replace the 45% of electricity that's made from fossils in Europe. We have to replace all the heating that's done now with natural gas and with coal and oil. And we have to replace all the transport that's now done with diesel and petrol and, and what have you. So we, we, we did a, a, a little study uh, on this, and, but oh, by the way, there's one area that I don't see that we can possibly uh, use electricity for, and that's for passenger jets with 150 uh, to 500 uh, um, persons on board. Uh, I believe we'll always have to have the high energy that's contained in the hydrocarbon molecule, and I see that being looked after by, by biofuels. And as you know, there are lots of experiments going on at the moment, and biofuels can work perfectly well uh, in aircraft. Now, there's a whole bunch of assumptions that I'm not so sure I want to go into them all because, uh, you know, I prefer to, you know, sit down and have a debate with the audience and, and, uh, and with Alan. Um, but we did assume that offshore wind would have a capacity factor of 60%. Uh, we, on other occasions, if you have heard me speak and, and listen to the Doyle Committee that was chaired by Hildegard Nocton, she said we should be building 75,000 megawatts off the west coast of Ireland in, in wind speeds of 11 metres per second. And this should become government policy. Now, the government fell at that stage, so we don't know what's going to happen to that particular policy. But we would be supplying 5% of Europe's electricity uh, if we did manage to do that. Uh, we'd be, we'd be uh, the sales of, of that power at 5 cents a kilowatt hour uh, would be twice what we get from all our agricultural activity in Ireland. Um, and it would be in perpetuity and it would earn something like 500 million a year for the government for, for doing absolutely nothing. We made a whole series about, uh, we're talking about the public supply of electricity, but the private supply of electricity is going to grow dramatically. We estimate that 128 million houses uh, by 2050 will have their roofs made out of, either retrofitted with, with solar panels, or the tiles that, that actually are the roof are photoactive tiles. Uh, I know that in Germany there are three manufacturers at the moment uh, who, who manufactured these tiles. So instead of having these inert, uh, you know, concrete tiles, I suppose, is what they are, um, you'll now have photoactive tiles which you'll put your charge into a battery uh, power wall in the basement. Um, so we made that assumption because I think it's quite reasonable and that all our houses actually should be designed like that. We assumed that 99% of private vehicles and, 90, and, and, and 99 to 100% of all small uh, commercial good vehicles and large, large things that, that, that drag goods across the continent, that they'll all be electrified as well. Now, there's dozens and dozens of schemes uh, as, to, as to how that might be done, uh, but I believe that is the logical way to go. You get enormous benefits of efficiency when you use electricity for transport. 
the efficiency is about 95%, whereas the average internal combustion engine has an efficiency of between 14 and 20%. So what we didn't do uh, in, in the sums that I'm going to just show you now was, was look at how much um, fossil fuel stuff that we put into the chemical firms, uh, the cement firms, the, the steel making firms in Europe. And this is enormous and we have to tackle that sometime, but I didn't take it into account in this particular calculation. The current demand for electricity in Europe is 3,100 terawatt hours per year, never mind what terawatt hours are. Uh, there's going to be 7,800 of them in the near future. Um, and that's a 250% increase. So we're entering the enhanced electricity era. Um, and, and electricity is, is an incredible product in the sense you can move it around. And if you look at the logistics of how you know, our energy arrives in Europe at the moment, it arrives by ship or by pipeline. Think about coal and oil and gas. Um, and then think about electricity. Well, that comes by cable. And so... What will, what will be happening in Europe is that the big winds are out around the periphery, as you saw from what I, what I put up previously. Uh, you know, the, the great wind speeds are at sea, and we have the technology now to access them. And so we'll be taking energy from the periphery and bringing it into uh, the centre. Uh, you know, and with floating technology, we'll be able to access the really high wind speeds. Um, so as I, I did point out that there'll be four... 45% of electricity in Europe is made from coal at the moment, uh, and that'll all be replaced. And we'll need 900,000 megawatts of wind power installed and 900,000 megawatts of solar PV. Now, there are three major issues uh, that raise their heads when you think about this kind of a, a major enhanced electricity future. Uh, first of all, there are no grids at sea. Uh, there's, nobody's ever thought about this. And wind and solar are variable or intermittent sources of electricity. So, you know, respectively, and when I say respectively, I mean wind, wind is, is never on-off, but solar is always on-off. You don't get much solar electricity at night. Um, and, and we also said there'd be a net flow of electricity from the periphery to the centre. So, let me just put this one up. Oh, yeah, that, that was a, a picture of the, 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 the solar resource across Europe. And it's, if anything was ever self-explanatory, I think that is two seconds and you got it. Um, so, the first issue uh, is in outline, easy to deal. How do you build a grid? Well, you know, we need to overlay existing grids with the new grid at sea, which collects the power uh, at, at those kind of red, uh, pink, I don't know what colour that is really, um, at those dots. That we call those super nodes. We collect the power there. We transform it to whatever voltage is needed. We route it to where it's most needed in Europe at the time. Um, and there, you know, there are major commercial opportunities here for a company that sees and designs that new grid. And with this in mind, I've set up a company uh, to design uh, and invent the technology for this new grid. And I call this company Supernode. It is using a certain property of materials uh, called superconductivity. At cryogenic temperatures, in this case that of liquid nitrogen at minus 200 degrees centigrade, the resistance of this material falls to zero. Um, and they allow for the bulk transfer of power without losses over any distance, so long as the temperature is kept down at minus 200. Now, this is a, a quantum phenomenon, and engineering, interestingly to scientists in the audience, engineering and science have entered the quantum field right now. You know, this, is a, this electricity is transferred in a, a strip of material which is 1.2 microns thick. Now, the average hair is 100 microns thick, right? Your hair is 100 microns thick. This thing is 1.2 microns thick, and it's four, four millimeters wide. In fact, we have it here. Um, anybody who wants to have a look at this later on uh, can, um, and you're welcome. Uh, now, to me, this is like magic. It's the closest thing to magic I've ever seen. Uh, you've heard about neutrinos. Um, neutrinos. Uh, have uh, no mass and no charge, just spin. Now, that beat me and still beats me, um, as does these uh, Cooper pairs that flow along these things. However, we're developing that technology here in Ireland, and I hope it's going to be one of the first great technological advances out of this country. We've, we've produced the most brilliant scientists here in Ireland and the most brilliant men of letters, the most brilliant debaters the world has ever seen. 
but we haven't been that great at developing our own technology. Well, my goal is to correct that now. And with this new company, we'll be seeking investors from the general public uh, towards the end of this year. So one of the great things about renewable energy is you're living in the present. And you know that psychologists always tell you that you should be living in the now. You should be living in the now. It's healthier to live in the now. Don't be living in the past and don't be fantasizing about the future. I'm sure there are psychiatrists and psychologists in the audience who would readily agree with that. The great thing about renewable energy is you capture it now, at wherever it is, and you use it now, or else you lose it. Um, and, and that's the world that we're facing into. So we're, and the sun, I'm told, will be there for another 4.5 billion years. So, you know, <laughs> uh, this human race of ours is, uh, is good to go for that period, so long as we can, turn it into, uh, we can turn the earth into a place that we can live. Now, to, th th there are three ways to deal with the variability of wind. And, and solar. And I think it's very important that any one of you, and I hope you will go forward from here with a, a zeal uh, to, to back your politicians and, to, and in your own lives to, to, to tackle uh, those who deny climate change. But you know, let's be, let's be clear, we can deal with the variability of wind and the, uh, and, and the on-off nature uh, of solar. And the first of these is to collect energy over a very large area. So I'd like you to conduct a little thought experiment. And just think about if you had solar stations all around the world, right? And a very big cable joining the whole lot. No variability whatever in that power, except maybe the odd cloud. But you'd, you know, you'd, you'd, so if you can collect your energy over a large enough area, you deal with a lot of the variability uh, of both wind uh, and solar. And it was that, um, it was that realization that in, in 2001 allowed me to conceive of the supergrid, which is what's on the slide in front of you there, that we could deal with the variability of wind by collecting it over a very large area. This was based on some research I read from the university, uh, I think it was of Essen in Germany, maybe it wasn't, but it was w w one, one, one excellent German university who studied this, and so we, uh, we, we conceived of the supergrid. That was picked up by Scientific American, which David referred to, which made me the world energy policy leader at the time. And right now, we're, we're setting our heart to build that because that will make us free of all uh, fossil fuels. Now imagine if we, if we just go one step further from thinking of wind and solar as separate, imagine if we link, as that chart shows you, uh, if we link the great wind resource of the north with the solar resource around the Mediterranean basin. In wintertime when we've got lots of big storms crashing around our coast and the sun isn't that strong down the south, so you have a natural flow of electricity going south. Uh, the opposite is the case uh, you know, in, in the summertime, when strong s solar around the Med and weakish winds in the north, so you would have. So this is the, this is the construct uh, that led to, um, that led to you know, the conception uh, of, the, of the supergrid. Now, the second way to deal with the variability of wind is to put in, to have a large bank of batteries. Uh, and this isn't so far-fetched now, as it, as it would have even appeared as late as five years ago. Uh, Elon Musk uh, went to the rescue of South Australia, who got more than 50% of their electricity coming from wind. And he put in a 100 uh, megawatt hour big battery based on lithium ion. And you know, here's the way, here's what's happening to the cost of lithium ion batteries now. And I expect that you know, this latter black line could be even steeper in its descent uh, than is shown there. Uh, that is going to follow like PV and come, come hunting down at about 18% a year. The third way to deal with the variability of wind and solar is demand side management. Now the technology is used currently to allow the demand for electricity follow the available supply. Freezers for instance can be turned off and it's not going to affect the produce inside. Same can happen in fridges. Um, I once led, read that the little red light on, the, on your television if they were all to be switched off in Ireland, there'd be hundreds of megawatts uh, saved. Heating could be turned down by one degree, and nobody would know the difference. The way all of this load management could happen is by way of price. At a pre-arranged price, um, which would be, uh, you know, going, the price would be going up when supply is down, uh, thousands of freezers could be switched off automatically. I mean, we have those smart meters in place right now to do all of this stuff. 
so we don't have to invent anything new. So that's our third stratagem, if you like, for dealing with the variability of wind and solar. And we talked about how energy currently arrives. But do we observe the planning, or indeed the vision anywhere, for this 100% renewable scenario in Europe? And unfortunately, we don't. And there are many reasons for this. And I just want to go into a few of the reasons. They seem, they seem to the layman, i.e. the non-politician, is trivial enough. Politicians are afraid of the cost of this revolution. Uh, the following is a quote from Jean-Claude Juncker uh, when asked about EU Commission plans for decarbonisation. He said, we all know what to do. We just don't know how to get elected after we've done it. Now, my own interactions with Irish ministers reinforce this, as some of them have articulated the same fear. Um, yeah. they've, they've articulated the same fear. And Mr. Varadkar recently said that global warming was good for some sections of society. They don't have to put as much heat into their houses. Hmm. Um, now, this organized uh, opposition can be easily organized in this, in this world of ours. When you look at the Gilles Jean in France, uh, that happened when the government there tried to introduce a carbon tax on petrol and diesel. Uh, and this can be thought of as part of a more general opposition to expert opinion, uh, such as led to Brexit and the opposition to water charges here. Uh, and this is one of the aspects of, of you know, social media impact. Now, efforts in Europe to introduce a carbon tax have been ham-fisted and completely ineffective at changing human behaviour. If you put a high enough price on carbon, people would adjust and stop uh, using carbon. Uh, but the ETS, the European Emission Trading Scheme, was introduced in 2005. Now, apparently it was somehow successful because the companies it introduced for had reduced their carbon emissions by 21% uh, last year. However, I don't think that the uh, emission trading scheme had anything to do with this. This was part of a, a much broader move in Europe to supply electricity from renewable sources. At around, and currently, the price of CO2 is two euros per tonne. Now, remember in the beginning of what I said, uh, we were looking at $79 per tonne is the actual cost of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and at two euros per tonne, no business, no small business, large business, any kind of business or a householder is going to change their behaviours. Um, so now at the time, I did advise them that this was a very silly scheme um, because we, we kind of knew at the time that Russia was going to be able to sell vast quantities of carbon credits because their economy had melted down. And, and so, so that's just an oversupply and supply and demand works. People could get credits for next to nothing and did. And the silence of economists on this is deafening. Their influence on policy is limited to the short term. Now, there are exceptions, and I hope Alan is one of them, but John Fitzgerald would certainly be an exception. Um, he's a professor here. And Lord Nick Stern in the UK has long talked about a proper price for carbon. And if one were to measure economists' response to global warming and compare it with economists' commentary on Trump's trade war with, with China, the disparity is alarming. Uh, it's costing global communities $2.9 trillion every year, and the costs are going up. And uh, there is a side effect to global warming which I would have thought economists should have an opinion on. Effects such as emigration into the EU from Africa, uh, which is at least partially caused by the southward march of the Sahara due to an increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. I, I do a lot of work in Ghana, and the north of Ghana is now becoming, you know, you can't use it for agriculture anymore because it's drying out. And I've just put a picture here just to try and communicate what's happening to you. This is Lake Chad, 1963 uh, to, to 2007. It's now one-tenth the size it was then. 10.7 million people are disrupted in that community. This is a real effect of global warming. These people's lives and livelihoods are completely um, you know, changed and, and affected by this. And the rise of Boko Haram can, of course, be somehow attributed uh, to some of this stuff. Um, and this is all real. This isn't fantasy from Greenpeace or some other NGO. Despite all of this, politics is moving, largely driven by Greta Thunberg and the Youth Rebellion. And I say many things. I say, God bless you, Greta, because you're doing the right thing, and long may you last. And I hope it's not just a, a passing movement. And we've pr been promised a new Green Deal by Mrs. van der Leyen in the Commission. 
And let us see how she can deal with the vested interests, particularly those in NSOE, at the cartel that represents EU transmission system operators who set their stall out against the EU supergrid. Um, because the world does not take into account the hidden costs and externalities of burning fossil fuel, the price of wind and solar, as I said, are compared with the bogus costs of generation from coal. In addition, the fossil industry has been prom promulgating the view, and I'd like to particularly emphasize this point with, with this audience, that gas is a transition fuel. Some, company, some companies have gone so far as to say that, that gas is actually nearly renewable. But when you burn a ton of coal, you, you release 2.8 tons of CO2. When you burn a ton of gas, you release 2.7 tons of CO2. Um, and uh, it, uh, recent research that was published in, in The Guardian there two weeks ago showed that um, the, the gas companies are understating the, amount, the release of methane gas into the atmosphere. Now, as you know, methane gas is either 20 or 80 times worse than CO2 in terms of its global forcing uh, of, of climate change. Um, so, you know, we are in a, we are in a difficult, uh, we're in a difficult position there because we're getting a lot of pseudo facts thrown at us. So renewable developers, manufacturers and turbine, of turbines and solar panels and other component suppliers are less profitable than oil and gas companies. Oil and gas companies, upstream oil and gas companies like the big ones, uh, are, um, are about 20% profitable. The profitability in the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers of wind and, and, and solar equipment, is at precisely zero. There's only one profitable company, and that's Vestas. So, you know, you, you, you have the opposite happening in this world of ours, which, you know, is dominated, of course, by economics and prices. But why would um, an oil and gas company invest in a renewable company like Mainstream? Because the profits are, are not going to be as high as what they're making. So there's a disparity there. There's, you know, the common good is not being met with this arrangement. So moving entirely to renewables with no fossil fuels used for energy represents a revolution uh, in people's thinking. I haven't spoken about the costs of this transition. In my opinion, a cost-benefit uh, study is needed to frame the debate. There are going to be massive winners, some losers, major new sources of employment, free fuel that's native to Europe, and major export opportunities to take the new technologies uh, to other global markets. In a rational world, this exercise uh, would be uh, conducted uh, by economists uh, who would seek to understand and explain to the public how we'll be replacing capital investment, we'll be using capital investment to replace operational costs. Europe spends 300, 260 billion a year on buying fossil fuels. Imagine that'll all be quenched when we go to 100% renewables. Anyway, that's over to The Economist. Um, you've been a great audience. You've been very quiet and somewhat responsive. So thanks very much for listening.
for listening to it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, it was a tremendously inspiring address. I, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I, I think it was a terrific message. I can understand Andy's frustration uh, with the lack of enthusiasm for economic instruments. Uh, I would suggest that economists themselves, maybe, are not to blame for this. Uh, economists will certainly characterize uh, global warming as a uh, perhaps the preeminent example of what we teach in our first year classes uh, of externalities, and they use that, that word. So, in other words, uh, we have, um, in this case, an economic bad, uh, something that we, 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 we want to stop, we want to prevent, uh, but which is not taken into account in decision making because there's no price. There, 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 and he emphasized this that in the comparison between uh, fossil fuel energy and renewable energies, uh, the, the fossil fuel energy uh, uh, gets, uh, if you like, a hand on a scale because uh, the uh, climate damages that are caused by that uh, are not uh, fully uh, taken into account. Indeed, in many places, would not be taken into account at all. So, uh, I think we have the apparatus to think about this. The next step, of course, is, is how to implement uh, um, uh, policies which, which do try to level the playing field. And here we have essentially two main uh, instruments. We have uh, regulations, and the regulations uh, can play an important uh, role. For example, uh, we have seen, thankfully, uh, improvements in the building regulations, so now new buildings uh, have to be built to a much higher energy standard than uh, the type of building that is quite most of us live in, which are drafty and, 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 and pretty inefficient at keeping uh, heat in. Uh, we see regulations play an important role in driving fuel efficiency uh, in, 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 in the vehicle fleet. Uh, okay, we want to move to, 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 uh, to zero uh, net emissions vehicles, but uh, until that happens, uh, it, it needs regular. Economic incentives can play uh, a, a really important role here. Uh, we all know the impact of the plastic bag tax uh, in that. It, 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 you know, we just simply do not see uh, the, the misuse of plastic bags in supermarkets because uh, a small, uh, a relatively small price in that was put on that. So, yes, we do need uh, to uh, uh, send a signal to industries, to uh, those who are uh, polluting uh, the atmosphere, uh, that that has a cost. Um, and uh, the, the, so I think economists would have that message. Um, there are, of course, debates within economics as to what that uh, appropriate cost of carbon uh, should be. And I'm very aware that uh, uh, economists are indeed uh, criticized because uh, sometimes the way we do the analyses uh, suggests that uh, costs uh, which are felt uh, maybe not even so far into the future, but into the future because we use discount rates. So the idea is that if you, if you have to incur the cost today, it, it, we, we know the value, but if it's in 10 years' time or it's in 20 years' time, uh, we discount that and we, we, we say that's less important. And of course, that discounts the impact of damages on future uh, generations. So there is a huge debate within uh, economics uh, as to you know, how do we uh, correctly uh, put a price on carbon. But I don't think, uh, I would say uh, that there was almost no economist who would disagree with that fact that we need to do that. And it needs to be a much higher charge than, uh, than the, uh, the charge that we have seen uh, today. So for example, uh, in the Climate Council, uh, where, where uh, I'm a member, uh, we have recommended that um, uh, the, the, the charge should go to at least 80 uh, euro per ton by, by 2030. That's probably still on the, on the low side. Um, uh, uh, and the, the last one was at least prepared to look at that, and they did increase the, uh, the tax, as you know, about the, the 26. We recommended the 35. But, uh, there are these political issues. And I think maybe just a final point, if I may just say, I think uh, uh, any raise.
raised this really important issue to think about, which is how do we overcome the, uh, the opposition to change? Uh, because this change, this transition to uh, a, a zero carbon economy is going to be disruptive. Uh, Eddie was talking mainly about the, uh, the, the electricity system itself uh, and the grid structure and so on. Uh, but, you know, if you think about what householders may be asked to pay in terms of retrofitting our, our, our houses and apartments, um, uh, uh, many of us buy second hand cars, many of second hand electric vehicles going to become available. Um, so we're going to, you know, if we're serious that we're going to ban the, uh, the purchase of new uh, petrol or diesel cars in 1930, uh, in and then uh, you know, does that mean we're going to have to fork out more for our, for our, for our vehicles? So there, there is a disruption, and how to minimize that, and in particular, how to ensure that the transition takes account of the equity uh, and, and, and justice dimensions is a huge issue. And actually, although economists do think about it, that is not really our strength, uh, uh, because we would not, uh, these are political decisions, how to distribute uh, that investment burden, how to distribute that, that burden of, of adjusting and, and, and the investments that are required. Um, so that is, it seems to me, the key question I could, uh, the technology is interesting and it's clearly uh, really important, but that political question of how you, uh, you face up to the disruption and the, the, the differential costs you mentioned my like, in agriculture, and theory in Ireland, you know, one of the issues is, 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 is the distribution of the burden between rural and urban people. Uh, uh, you know, in urban areas, potentially, at least, we do have transport choices. You know, uh, we can cycle to work or we can, uh, we, we can take public transport. That's not so easy. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's not so easy in, 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 in rural areas. So there are those distributional issues which do, uh, apart from the best of interest, which certainly exploit these, uh, these, these differences, but uh, you, we, we can't simply overlook them. Thank you very much, Alan. I thought at this stage we might ask the order of Luke uh, Fahili to uh, say a word from the uh, perspective of the younger generation. I wonder how you responded to Eddie's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank Eddie and Alan for excellent contributions this afternoon. It's been a very insightful and fair of talks. And I want to keep my comments reasonably brief so that we can open the floor to questions just for a little bit short of time. Um, but one thing that I'm really struck me is how the public engaged with the government and then how experts engaged with the public. It was there this sort of nothing so much as like irritation and sporadic topics to really get my time and good presentations and that they are easy to dismiss commentaries. So when experts say, well, here's a big technology that exists, but this is how we do it, if it's not convenient, then it, it's like you give a skate button and then, then it disappears. The same thing happens when the government says to, to the public. So, and very many of those actions as they need to do have been remarkably consistent and like they have succeeded in raising awareness to something they are ready for action and the, the, the agenda every Friday is described by climate. Whereas what we've seen over the last 30 years is not so much a building momentum of climate outreach, but more like this um, on and off approach. So, that I think it was either in the 2000s or around the time of our goal that there was the Inconvenient Truth came out and there's going to be a huge energy around tackling the climate crisis. But that, that tends to, from my perspective, in a specific way, I think that is incredibly frustrating for younger generations to see in that a huge amount of work had been done and that momentum evaporated um, and had been rebuilt then uh, by the people we see coming up through the movement. Um, I think the, the second point that I'd like to make very briefly is how you disseminate scientific knowledge, um, and particularly the, how you disseminate existing like, solutions that we have to problems. So I'm fortunate enough to work with a group of Professor Samir Ayakarosi, who is a professor in the Institute of Science and Cognitive Chemistry, she's a professor of microscopy, and an excellent academic. Her current research is focused both on microscopy and then with energy storage devices. So she specializes in supercapacitors and battery technologies. Um, which to, to address many of the issues that that Eddie raised, so um, I think she, she and I would probably disagree that we could have someday have um, things that are 
have, have we have boundaries with a high enough energy density that they can be powered by stored energy rather than combustion of biofuels. And a great area is the minority of science at the moment, in that she's been very, very well, they public aware of her work. How there are lots of scientists around the world um, who have solutions to these problems, where it's not either being effectively communicated to the public or effectively communicated to governments or legislators or, the, or business people to make properly enact these solutions. Um, so I think it would be, be part of tackling the climate crisis is tackling these massive problems we have in distributing information from the scientific um, community to the general population in a way that is not just like anyone saying, oh, so you have that, which, which back we want to do, we need to something like this, um, but in a meaningful way that is very accessible. Um, and I, I think that is actually one of the core issues that, that modern society sees um, in the gender of the expert, or the gender of respect to the expert. Um, I, I think I leave my comments there, and I'd like to open the question to all of Indeed. Uh, so perhaps we are stuck for time. I have three questions for you, and then you make a question rather than a speech, and we put it first of all to Dave and the other thing on. Would anybody like to make a question? Indeed. <coughs> Uh, where you're going to build, build offshore. So the, the whole thing is offshore, 
And, and here's the thing for the for, for the economists to consider. I think Alan would play some old tapes here. It used to be expensive to build a wind, and it used to be very expensive to build solar PV, and it used to be incredibly expensive to store electricity. But right now, you know, I get a lot, get a lot of facts there. I hope you can remember them. Uh, like we're building this stuff for really cheap. So in fact, there's a benefit to the customer, there's a net benefit to the customer now for, for buying renewably generated electricity. Um, and also, I mean, without a vision that people perish, that's a quote from the Bible. And it's, it's I, I keep on saying it to myself. If a politician can paint a vision of the future, he can do a lot of things that he's doing. But none of them actually are, have the confidence and the courage uh, to be able to, to be able to do this, to study what's going on out there and what technology is providing, and to be able to I mean, for instance, in Germany, for every wind turbine, for every maker that's produced a, 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 a manufacturer, so there were eight jobs created. There were eight jobs created. Now, you know, our politicians unfortunately, I mean, we're living in a fast change in Europe, and companies actually tend to be so far ahead of politicians. You see it with Facebook, you see it with Google, you see it with Amazon, you see it, you know, in, in, in the renewable space. That that you know, politics has a real challenge on its hands to try and keep up with what's happening there in society, uh, and in particular, back to conscious society. I think, and I think it's Terry's question. Uh, no matter what we do, uh, if they go on in China to coal power uh, stations and so on and so forth, this won't matter. And if I could just put a tail end on that, it seems to me that the, the possibility only for us uh, in Europe broadly is that we should invent technology and indeed turn those, as you just said, into jobs and exports and such like that. In other words, become the place in on the planet uh, which is actually inventing this new world, which I think uh, you are yourself uh, playing a major role in. Yeah, Perhaps you'd like to comment on, on, on this question. I think it's a good question. Uh, I mean, I I don't fall into the category of a person who thinks that China is you know, the great thief for the planet. Uh, I, would, I would see the Chinese as much the Deng Xiaoping and all the successes of Trump as being one of the great Americans taking the hundred million people out of power. And I see they built more wind and solar in China last year than in France and not. Uh, Modi uh, has, in, in India, has had a huge policy of installing wind and solar. Um, now, so, People don't always do what you want them to do, and what, what's happening in China is a lot of in this belt and road thing, uh, which is going to eventually cost seven trillion. Some of the Chinese businessmen are going down to Pakistan and are building some coal fired power stations there. But, you know, there's more coal being retired now in the world than there is fuel to be built. So it's not all actual doom and gloom, and I think the Chinese are very enlightened in many respects. I mean, they're, the rate at which they did. You heard about the hospital that was built in two weeks. Wouldn't that be great here with the children's hospital? <laughs> two weeks. And, and Jim Du, who was a great, uh, you know, pardon, and, and, and non elected, the Minister of Foreign Affairs here, uh, he, he was contracted by the Chinese to, to help out with some of the civil engineering project. And he went back two years later. And, you know, he was at the meeting and we don't talk about the project. Like, oh, there you are, we reached that nine months ago. And he expected to go on for another five years. So I, I, I expect the Chinese to leave in this regard. They've led with PV. Goldwing, the company that we bought turbines from, uh, are now you know, on top of the list down there and they're selling all around the world. Uh, and I see the Chinese, they have a bigger reason to deal with global warming than anybody else because they're sending better benefits. The great mountain chains of the Chad the and the Himalayas and all that that they need to put, they prevent the winds uh, from the Sufi. Indian Ocean moving into China, so it's semi desert and it's getting more so with every year that goes by, just like we talked about the Sahara. So I think just the natural um, self preservation of China is going. And, and in, in, with Modi, it's got to be cost. It's just got to be cost. We're cheaper than coal, so, so I'd be, I'd, you know, just we've got to get those facts out there. Uh, that's all I can say about that. I mean, I, yeah, we are trying to create new technology and, and hopefully we do that. But, uh, but, but it doesn't have to be a new creation because we're already cheaper with wind and solar uh, than, than any other uh, type of gas or coal fire. I think this has been truly phenomenal. And I think that uh, people nodding, uh, saying, I don't mean nodding in their sleep, I take nodding. <laughs> but this has been really a salutary experience for us. 
It reminds me of the time, uh, and I know that Paddy Cunningham was there that night, when Igor Schwetz, who I don't believe Igor here tonight today, I don't think so, but Igor of our physics department uh, proposed a project called Spirit of Ireland. And he uh, had done a back of the envelope calculation and said, you know, Ireland could become a net exporter of our energy. And we heard uh, the uh, Hildegard Lockton proposal that we could have all of these uh, wind farms off Western Ireland. And we could be supplying, we would be exporting energy. Imagine that Ireland would be exporting energy. That is possible. And it's possible with the kind of technology and the kind of vision which I think. Eddie O'Connor has shown us today. And occasionally, I feel that he doesn't think about the work. But after a lecture like this, I feel that we're moving in the right direction. And it's wonderful that an Irishman is leading the charge. Thank you very Thank much, Eddie.